page for all of the media collaborations that were we put there. And if you notice at the end of the day, there will be about 20 jobs that have been posted across the world that we're going to be putting up pretty soon after this. So make sure you connect there because that's where a lot of people are coming from. That's how we got Clifton out of, out of his kitchen. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, Pam, I see you're coming aboard. How are you? I'm good. How are you? All right, guys. Everybody gets a little reunion. So, <laughs> so we have a few shirts left. So I'm going to have to put that. You guys do a direct message to me if I don't have your address. Some of you already have your addresses. And we'll make sure you get those things. So welcome, everybody. Sharna, how, you yeah. see, how was that birthday celebration? You know, you don't, well, get, to, you don't get to turn 21 every day. Well, no, let, I, I really need you to understand this, Terry. Please. <laughs> I am 17 and a half. OK, please, please understand and get that right. Oh, well, we're looking forward to you on our stage for City Men Cook in June. Oh, are, we, are we doing it live this year? Oh, that's going to be up to the board. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, this, uh, we're growing and uh, we have some stuff there too. And I'd like to welcome, uh, welcome one of my partners in crime, Brother David Tyson, all outside. Hello, good, make hello, good brother. <laughs> that's right. I got to take advantage of this vitamin D opportunity, man. <laughs> <laughs> All you communicators and, and, and uh, influencers, it's good to be here. We get started about 5.40, so we have about two minutes. Let me just give you the format. We're going to be talking to all of our friends here. So you guys got about two minutes to still openly chat and start texting each other and I mean, uh, putting stuff in the chat. Welcome. So we, we pay for these these T-shirts? The T-shirts go to the, the cost? Cash, but, but there is a cost. We'll, we'll get okay. it to you. Now, how do you pronounce your name? Because it's an interesting spot. My name? Yeah, I'm looking at you. It's Jacqueline. Um, it used to be Williams. <laughs> and then I got married to a, a guy from Gambia, and it's Jarju. See that? Sort of Senegalese. So it's full French. Jacqueline Jarju. I love it. I love it. Love Not Jarju. Ja so many people call me Ja Rule. I was like, oh my God. Now, have you ja spent Rue. any time in Ghana? Are, are, are you spending any time in Ghana? Oh, uh, in the Gambia. Gambia. It was the Gambia, yeah. The Gambia where uh, Kunta Kente. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, I love Kunta Kente. Alex, <laughs> Alex, <laughs> Alex Haley. Alex Haley, yes. I actually went to that island, Jufere Island. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And you saw parts of uh, the filming uh, that they have, like where the forts and stuff were. They're still there. Uh, but the people are very, very poor. And I heard Alex Haley got the raw um, end of the deal. He didn't oh. get a lot of money from um, that whole thing, which really changed the world. People started researching their ancestry because of that movie. Right, and, and that book ancestry.com. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and uh, no, and his, his actual ancestors are on that island and they're living very poor. And I was just disgusted, you know. They have they used to have before the pandemic a roots festival, and that would be every other year. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Hey, that's a great share. Uh, I appreciate you sharing all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're so happy. I, I was. Go ahead, David. No, I was just saying I, I, I wanted to get the pronunciation correctly because I've, I've got a couple friends who have um, whom have been traveling back and forth to Ghana and, and they were oh, talking okay. about how great Ghana was and uh, people that are American, African Americans, you know, Black African Americans who live here that are moving to Ghana. So uh, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Where I'm from, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, oh, it's so many people <laughs> that have had um, houses and stuff traveling back and forth to Ghana since I was a little girl for maybe 40 years. And it's so wow. weird how now is the, is the thing. I actually yeah. have a girlfriend who's been living there for over 30 years. Um, 
so now she got her dual citizenship. She said she never bothered until now they have this year of return. So, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. How is the pandemic there? Uh, you know, actually the African countries are doing much better than Europe and America because they could not afford, they could not afford for it, for it to become, you know, a big thing there. Uh, they don't have the infrastructure. So they basically close down everything. So the land borders close down and everything and the heavy precautions. Jamaica is doing the same thing. So actually they're, they're faring better than Europe and America. Hmm. I heard that too in that Naomi, what's the actor, uh, the uh, model, Naomi? Is it? Naomi Campbell. Naomi Campbell. Yeah, she, that's where she's hanging out hmm. in Africa. She, she, hmm. Oh, this is awesome. Well, Stevie Wonder said he moving there. He sure did. He <laughs> mm -hmm. sure did. I'm going when he go. I'm a <laughs> is, is he is he moving to Ghana specifically? Or? Yeah, he yeah. said he's oh, moving. Okay. He, he got said he's going to Ghana. Ghana. They go I take have... him down the street and tell him that's where he is. <laughs> I have a client from Zambia, <laughs> and she told me that they had to get it right, and they learned how to get it right through Ebola. Having uh, to contain it, deal with that. Yeah, that's true too. Sorry, that's Karen, true too. Karen, if you people can't show their face, can't speak. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. And the 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 casualties from Ebola, which um, and SARS, and this is that. just another Much form better. of SARS. It was just so <laughs> devastating. Right. So they're taking it seriously. Still in the Gambia, you can't drive anywhere. Totally landlocked. Mm. It can't, they shut down everything. And if you don't have that, uh, just like if you fly anywhere, if you don't have that no, certain no. type of COVID <laughs> test, okay. 72 hours before, they, they stick you somewhere mm. for two weeks. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. She doesn't say quarantine. They do stick you somewhere. I'm they going stick to open you somewhere. My, I had a friend that was quarantined. He didn't listen to me. So he was quarantined in Dubai. He came from Nigeria. All right, you guys. Let's, I'm going to go ahead and get started. But before we uh, officially start, I want you guys to do something that's been very, very hard to master doing uh, all the Zoom calls. I do about four or five Zoom calls a day, seven days a week. It's, wow. it, it, oh, God, it, I, should have invested, I should have invested in the company, but before we get started on our program today and our, our, our gatherings, this is very informal. It's informal, it's informative, it's engaging, it's enlightening, but it's culturally centered and it's very intentional. So we're very glad that you're here. So before we get started, I want all of you who brought your drinks to hold your drinks up. So Tony's going to do a screenshot. I've got to go get one. Man. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, look at that. What you got there? Ginger beer. Okay. Hold your drinks up. Tony, Tony let us know you got your screenshot. I all your drinks oh, up. Oh, my. <laughs> okay, how did you open that? Can't so this is All right. Did you get the screenshot <laughs> there, Tony? Oh, no, hold on a second. I don't have a person. All your drinks up there. All right, Tony, we're waiting on you. <laughs> All right, I'm not. It. I'm not. I'm not sure if I got it. I tried this before and I and I didn't get it. Um, what, what do you have to press on a Mac to get it? I forget. Was it Control what? R N C. Huh? Uh, or P R N Control P R N. I think it's uh in it's the insert key on on mine. There's a print screen yeah. underneath it. All right. Well, I, I, I'm i going to capture y'all. Hold your drinks one more time. I'll take it up here with my hands. Okay. Here we go. Gotcha. You can put those drinks down. Now, the other house rule I'd like to share is that learn how to do something that most of us adults haven't been doing. Control your mute. So when your grandmama or big mama <laughs> come in the room, when your big mama come in the room, make sure we don't hear you talking to her, especially when she said you haven't eaten your titlins. So we still want to know about it, okay? So make sure you look at your screen and also control the mute. But thanks everybody for being here. Uh, this is the Media Collaborative. We have members of NABJ and members of PRSA, NBPRS, entrepreneurs who are in marketing, PR, 
and we have esteemed guests. And this is where we exchange, empower, and move forward. I just want to give everybody a high five for us being so collectively great at what we've done. That we've gotten contracts with each other. We've gotten jobs. We've gotten uh, things. A matter of fact, one of the most successful debuts we had with the with uh, our our friend Re Regina Taylor's Black Album mixtape was because of the work you guys done, uh, and we had were able to show that mixtape and information about that tape appeared in almost 38 news outlets. And also uh, the social media was amazing. So thank you for that. We're gonna start recording so that we will save this and archive it. I'm gonna change it to speaker view. Here's the housekeeping. And I want to, um, well, I'll introduce our speakers. We'll get our questions going. If you have a question, Tony's gonna gather it in the chat. So make sure that you are putting it in the chat so that we can get there. Although this is informal, we want to make sure everyone has a level of participation. This is a happy hour and we try to stick to that hour. So our format today is we're going to chat and engage with Regina. We're going to chat and engage with Linda. And we're going to hear from our esteemed board member, Chelsea Fuller, who is uh, the NBG Media Related Board Rep. And also um, then we're going to hear from you guys. So make sure that you're doing that. So um, I'm, if you're on speaker view, I'll let Tony and Sherna and Linda stand up and show the shirts that you will be getting when you when you get the link. Just throw off the shirts, y'all. Congratulations for wearing them. The shirt says social distancing does not mean social disengagement. Let's get engaged. All right. So everybody will get one of those as well when we have the link. Thank you guys for standing up. Uh, let's just get started. First of all, I want to introduce someone I'm, 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 I can honestly say, you know, I love it when we watch a lot of shows and people go, I want to introduce my friend. And you know, they probably just met just five minutes before the show, but <laughs> this time I can honestly say that this person has been a colleague, a friend, a warrior, an accomplice with me, um, a, a game changer, a community activist, and um, just about everything. And I've known her, we've known each other for at least four, four months. <laughs> just kidding. We've known each other since school. She's a member of my School. She's an alumni at my school, SMU, Southern Methodist University. And today I'm just proud to introduce Regina Taylor. And if those of you haven't known her, amaz amazing imprint. Hold on, you guys. I got four people need to come into the room. Sorry about that. All right, here we come. Let's let these people in. Okay, here we go. Make sure, make sure you go on mute, please. As you come into the room, make sure you mute it. We call these mass shootings, but maybe mass killings. All right, Manny, let's make sure you mute it. <laughs> of course, Regina Taylor's imprint is all over the world. Uh, she's an actor, director, playwright, educator, active friend, alumni, and she's the is Meadows Distinguished Visiting Artist and the Andrew Mellon Playwright in Residence at the Repertory Street Theater in St. Louis. Uh, it's a three-year appointment with the National Playwright Residency Program established by Andrew Mellon Found Foundation and Howlin' Round Theater Commons. And I, I, love, I love the fact that she's uh, working with that team there. She is my, she's the person that uh, I always go to for creative input and her power. Her playwright, playwright credits include Bread, Crowns, which had four Helen Hayes Awards, for, including Best Director, Trinity River Plays, uh, Stop Reset, Drowning Crow. And she's writing new plays that I'm sure she's going to talk about. She's featured in H HBO's Lovecraft. Um, oh, I could go down the list. Uh, my favorite is, of course, I'll Fly Away, where she played Lily Harper. Uh, and, and then she's guest starred on Council of Dads on NBC. And then The Red Line, produced by another friend of mine, Ava DuVernay. Her television roles include The Unit. She was the first... African American lead in Masterpiece Theater's Chorus Unchained. That started as Anita Hill and HBO Strange Justice Award, was featured in Good Day to Die with Sidney Portier, and uh, she co starred in USA Network's Dig. I am just proud to know that she's a part of our planet this time and living during my lifetime. Um, just to add a few film credits Saturday Church, Clockers, Lean on Me, Courage Under Fire. And she's the first black woman to play Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. They should have really renamed the name of the play after Regina's imprint was gone. And today, 
we've we've circled back because we're working together on the Black Album mixtape. Let's talk about that. It's, it's it's an invitation for collaborators from all fields, including the media, to explore and tackle the questions under the current amount, moment of a national and international scale. I had shared in my column that we are in a moment that we need to maintain the momentum for it to be a movement. So please, please, please show your, your applause on screen for Regina Taylor. How are you, Regina? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for that warm welcome. Thank you all for all of your support. We've had an amazing journey with the Black Album Mixtape. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is, and then we'll get into some of the things that we can do with it. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, it started out as a play uh, that was done online, rehearsed and done online this past fall at SMU. Um, I started talking to SMU about how we continue to create, how we continue to teach during the time of COVID and shutdown. Uh, with that, I responded by writing this play called The Black Album Resistance 2020, the subject matter being what it is to be Black in 2020. It was then for the African American students at Meadows School of the Arts to take on the issues from COVID-19 to George Floyd to uh, the very incendiary race, political race, uh, that then erupted with all of this fracturing, uh, continued fracturing of this country. Uh, is what the play was about. It was delivered online and then continuing with the initiative, uh, I wanted to turn over those issues, those subjects that we need to speak on right now as the world is shifting up under our feet. Uh, and we don't know which direction we're going in from one moment to the next. Uh, those things we need to speak on, how we got here, uh, where we might be headed, uh, and how we might learn from the past to direct uh, some better outcomes for tomorrow. Uh, this is not the time for us to be silent. So to encourage people across the board to speak on what's going on in our lives, not just here, but everywhere and globally all at once. And that's the first time I've seen anything like this happening all at once to everyone, for everyone to be able to weigh in on this platform called the Black Album Mixtape. It is a website for people to uh, respond to what they're feeling across all disciplines and all ages, uh, whether you are an artist, uh, whether you are a musician and want to write something about uh, what does protest sound like? Whether you are uh, an architect thinking about how we plan uh, urban cities moving forward, whether you're a doctor uh, dealing with COVID-19 patients and you want to do a podcast or an article, uh, whether you are visual or uh, otherwise oriented, uh, it is for everyone to respond on this site. Um, uh, it, it has been a journey in the planning of it and the implementing of it. Uh, I am overwhelmed in terms of, of um, the responses that I'm receiving, uh, how people uh, want to speak on it. Uh, I have a group uh, in LA, uh, a women's shelter, uh, that is speaking on how they have survived during this pandemic. I have a group in, in Virginia, high school students, who are going to do half a minute um, segments on their on their cell phone every every day for seven days uh, around the George Floyd verdict. Uh, they'll be doing half a minute. Uh, what are they looking at? What do they need to respond to in half a minute for seven days? And we'll see what that compilation looks like. Um, I have uh, people creating Black Bone China uh, dinnerware uh, in response to the prompt of uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, it, it, it is um, really amazing how people want to respond. And I am encouraging all of you then in terms of uh, who do you want to speak to? Uh, who do you want to give a platform to? Um, 
What do you want to say in this moment in time that you feel is very relevant, needs to be heard, needs to be discussed? How do you want to inspire and ignite uh, the Black Album Mixtape? Hey, Regina, thanks so much. That is a great start in the beginning of this dialogue about the Black Album. I am so happy to have participated and talk and been able to contribute to this oral history. Thank you for your imprint, uh, just not just across the global space, but just your imprint on making sure our, our narrative is controlled by us. There have been a lot of conversations out there that they call crucial conversations on this time of racial reckoning. And, and you've launched this project, which I, I am just so happy it's out there and you're soliciting entries for it. And I, I know that we're focusing on, the backdrop is focusing on the significance of 2020 and how defined by the COVID-19 pandemic and the social unrest and the death of George Floyd and continuing to be death of others that's happening out there. I have a question. Can you give us the, the give us some type of directive or impact that you're trying to do with this particular crucial conversation with the Black Album mixtape? What Not yet. Is that's a part. Yes. One, one. I think a lot of people are on the floor right now. I know sometimes, some days I am on the floor. Uh, overwhelmed by what's going on uh, on the floor and feeling that, like they're in the dark. Uh, this is a moment. This is a mo this is a very crucial moment in in history. Uh, over this, uh, thinking about how life has changed over the last twelve months, uh, I can I can say that I have lost at least one person that is significant to me each and every month. Uh, those people who help define who I am. Uh, going through that, also going through this in your face, uh, people who have lost their minds coming up to you and telling you what they really think about you uh, type of thing, uh, where things are erupting, uh, people are fracturing, uh, things, are, things are shifting in a very in your face kind of way. Uh, it, at times is, is, is really scary and you're on the floor uh, feeling that you're in the dark, uh, that I, I encourage people then to speak on all of it, how all of it touches you, uh, how it touches you, so that people know that they're not alone in these journeys. It is a platform for people, a call and response for people to share uh, and to witness testify on this moment in time and give encouragement or caution to how we move forward. Uh, uh, challenge is nothing new to us in this country. And I think we have to look back on uh, those challenges that we have overcome how we've done that, how we have not only survived, but how we have thrived uh, through those challenges up till now. Again, challenges, uh, at moments they can be devastating, but to know that even as you feel that you're in the dark alone, that you never are. Uh, give it a minute, breathe deeply, uh, connect, continue to connect through all of this. Uh, and you will make it through uh, in one shape or fashion. Thank you for sharing, Regina. That's what we call this a happy hour because after that great message, I, I, we do need to take a drink. Um, <laughs> where are we? How do we get here? How do we imagine and arrive a better future? You're soliciting entries that uh, from students, professionals, people in the art storytellers, griots, people in the media, people in the arts, technology, science, and activism, because it's a, it, those are spokes on the wheel. And so all of those spokes need to be on the page. So um, how, how, what's the process and categories of these submissions? Can you share uh, that? Because I think we're going to have a block party, I think. Uh, right? Yes. Uh, on uh, May the 11th, we'll have a block party. That'll be the final event uh, where we celebrate uh, everyone who collaborated with us on on the black out uh, the black album mixtape, and we'll give uh, some awards. Uh, we'll have an award ceremony, cash awards, to those who are under twenty one uh, in the category of technology, uh, activism, art, 
uh, science and those who are over 22 in those same category. Uh, it'll be a celebration and we'll go from city to city because I've been working with people not only at SMU and Dallas, but uh, some HBCUs, um, Howard University, uh, to Jackson, to um, uh, Spelman, uh, 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 NYU, to um, other universities across the country, other institutions such as Oregon Shakespeare Festival, to uh, Repertory Theater of St. Louis, uh, New York Stage and Film, and others. So we'll be hopping from city to city, uh, giving some shout outs to uh, various people who want to present uh, their voices at that moment in time. Thank you, Regina. Uh, last fall, thank you for the participation with you last fall when we did the performance uh, with the SMU students, the Black Album 2020 Resistance. Uh, guys, it's available. We'll put it in the chat and also email it out to you if you want to ask a question to Regina, please put it in the chat. Tony will put it together. Also, if you uh, want to get the press release, we're either going to load it in the chat and we also will give it to you there. But the Black Album 2020 Resistance was an amazing dialogue. It was a highly personalized collection of vignettes and, 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 and what I call intense, intentional moments that examine the question of what it is to be Black at this historically significant moment. And, you know, I ask you this question all the time, Regina, is how do we take this moment and how do we make it a movement? What will the uh, mixtape do for us to put, put it there? This is a collaboration, of course, so talk to us about that. Uh, yes, it, it is a time for us to speak. Uh, we, we've had moments when, when uh, that speech has been suppressed. I, I think about things that are happening right now, and it feels like there's a, kind of like a Harlem Renaissance happening where uh, uh, people are soliciting Black voices uh, in the media, uh, whether that's also, it's also been very commercialized. Uh, 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 where you see uh, protests happening in commercials. Uh, so it makes me um, applaud, but also question uh, in terms of its purposes. And, and we do need to be very intentional, I think right now, in terms of the purpose of these voices, the content. It, it is a time in, in uh, my industry where you see uh, uh, a whole bunch of, of Black producers, and I think that's very key, uh, Black producers, directors, uh, DPs, people across the board. When I did um, Lovecraft Country, I, I was quite moved by the amount of people of color on that set in all positions, but starting from the top. And they were not only people of color, they were conscious people of color. Uh, that moved me, that surprised and moved me. Uh, that, uh, that show got out and said what it said. Uh, I, I was shocked by it. How did it get out, especially in this moment in time? Uh, it, it is that moment in time uh, when uh, I think because of, of uh, some destabilization of certain um, institutions uh, that we have uh, an opening to speak and speak freely uh, and to document that, uh, those things we need to make connection with amongst our communities and to encourage, to empower people to speak. It couldn't have happened like, what was it, five years ago with Colin Kaepernick uh, right. when he decided that he would speak and he was shut down. Um, this is a different moment. I don't know how long it's going to last, but in this moment, I think we need to shout about it. Uh, we need to document it. We need to lay some foundations. We need to make sure that this next generation um, has some clarity, has some, some insight into what we've gone through uh, and what we will continue uh, to, to have to navigate uh, so that they have an idea of, of past strategies to try to figure out new strategies uh, to move it again forward from here. Uh, that's my purpose in terms of the Black Album mixtape. Oh, Regina, thank you so much. And let me just say to everyone who's listening, um, I've got, I'm looking in the chat, I'm seeing your request. And if you have a question, let me know. And uh, so that Regina can answer it. Um, the, uh, I did put my little part in there about how we need 
we're in a moment that needs to have ma to maintain to create a momentum. It was inspired by a conversation I had with Regina at lunch before COVID. <laughs> so it's, we were at, we were at lunch together, and I think it's important as we as communicators and people who manage other communicators and those who tell the stories that focus around social justice, racial reckoning, and the fact that we we've got to turn this around. I mean, even now, I found people having conversations about reparations, and those people are not even black. And uh, we've had four states saying that being a black male may be an endangered species is a public health issue. Uh, once again, the works can be include video, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Regina, video, music, audio, images, monologues, photos, uh, designs, text, interviews, and self-interviews. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And share with me, you know, I, I say this all the time about you, so you're not surprised. Uh, it is great that you walk along the lines of the greats. We know that you're an iconic representation of, of our culture in this country, and we know that your work has been succinctly directed to say, I'm going to only do things that's going to move that deal and show us in the grace that we are. You walk along other greats like yourself, like Cecily Tyson, and people who have just chosen that we're, I'm only going to do good stuff. So what, why the Black Album mixtape and why, why now? I, I am called to do this right now. I, I uh, started out very early uh, with being indoctrinated by my mother. Uh, she taught me how to write. That was the greatest gift that she gave me as a child to be able to write children's books at four years old, uh, imprinting on me that this is a survival tool. As you can imagine it, you can do it. You start with your imagination. You dream it, you imagine it. Uh, you roll up your sleeves, some hard work, but you got to you got to navigate through some things. So you have to strategize uh, the, the, the tools of, of writing, the, the tools of, of creating uh, can take you any direction you want to go in. One, naming yourself in this world as people will try to name you before your first breath. We'll try and write that narrative for you from beginning to end. Uh, that you do have some choices here. Uh, this is your survival tool, child, is what she told me. Uh, and it has served me well. Oh, it's amazing. And I would be remiss if I did not congratulate you on your latest accomplishment. And I think we all will put your congratulations in the chat there. But uh, Regina Taylor oh. is going to be uh, to play Michelle Obama's mother in the Showtime's anthology series, uh, The First Lady. Uh, so I am so happy for you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to start that project, starting Viola Davis, Showtime. Uh, I think it's nine series. They give nine series to each woman uh, from uh, First Ladies, uh, from Michelle Obama uh, to Eleanor Roosevelt to Betty Ford. I think Michelle Pfeiffer is playing Betty Ford. Uh, I'm really uh, excited uh, to play Michelle Obama's mother. Uh, I, I've been watching tapes of her. I'm reaching out if anyone knows her, I would love to meet her. I feel some responsibility in, in creating, not creating, but uh, portraying a real life person, you wanna get it right. Uh, I, I go to Chicago quite a bit and people will let me know if I don't. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very excited and very honored to play this role. Oh, and no one's more excited than me to, to know that um, your work speaks for itself and that playing her moms is gonna be an exaltation. And as a member of MBK Alliance, I know this is going to happen without me, Regina, but I will make sure that you can get a conversation with her mom. I've already reached out to them to congratulate them, and I already told them that you know you got a winner playing this role. I mean, in addition to earning a Golden Globe Award, two Emmy nominations, five-time NAACP Image Award nominee, and all of the big screen work you do. I mean, this is a win-win for Michelle's mom. So she should probably is going to be calling you before I can ask her to call. Well, I I. I... <laughs> I look forward to that. It is, it is a, an honor to be in this project. And again, something where I think uh, playing this and, and that they are doing this uh, tie, can tie uh, art and activism. I've been, I've been very 
uh, lucky, I've been privileged uh, my whole career to, to be able to, to do some roles that, um, that tie together uh, that, uh, that fact. Uh, first role that I ever played uh, for film uh, TV, TV movie of the week, uh, was a crisis at Central High about the first black students to integrate the Arkansas school system. Uh, and it, it kind of fell in my lap. I was wandering around in, at Meadows at SMU. Somebody came up because I was stalking Henry Fonda uh, and asked me if I was an actress. I said, sure, why not? Uh, I went to the audition and I got it. Uh, made up a fake resume, uh, did a Polaroid and walked in the room and, and I got the role of Minnie Jean Brown, uh, one of the first students to integrate the Arkansas school system. It then spoke to me in terms of mission, purpose, those things that my mother had whispered in my ear as a child, uh, wanting me to be a writer and empowering me to write my story. Uh, that, that piece, that first acting role on TV uh, solidified uh, what I thought was a, a given mission uh, to, to tie arts and activism. Uh, it's a, a very powerful uh, medium in terms of giving people hope. Speaking of Cicely Tyson, I was very moved uh, when, when she passed. I remember, I remember the first time I saw her on TV, that was back black and white TVs uh, and uh, West Dallas projects. And visiting my grandmother. And it was back in the day when if you ever saw a black person on the screen and they look like you and they acted like you in terms of your full authentic self, not the fake you that they would like parade around on the screen, but the real you, she was the real thing. Uh, this chocolate woman uh, that was shining through again, real authentic self that you could identify with. Me being this child, running up to the screen, running up and down the street, because that's what you would do. Uh, telling the neighbors to come on in, you gotta see this. You have to see this woman. Uh, it gave us hope. It gave us uh, a feeling of self and the possibilities of self. Amen. I know how powerful this medium is. Amen, Regina. And you know, I was not less than two blocks down from you, those same projects where we all would gather when a black person showed up on television. Same year, remember? We would go in there, go, come, everybody come to the living room. We got, there's, there's Diane Carroll or Cecily Tyson. Uh, it was an awesome time at this point. And it's good to yeah. see that we are in a racial reckoning that is asking us to reclaim ourselves. And it's, it's also allowing us to re, to control the narrative so that we yes. don't get their story. We don't get the Angie Mama pancake box story. Mm -hmm. All right, we get the big mama story. My big mama, your big mama. So once they did that, uh, mm -hmm. at this point, uh, thank you for sharing. I'm gonna see if we have any questions. We're trying to be on, on time. So, uh, Tony, do we get any questions for him? And while we're waiting for a question, Tony, I want Mona, Tara, Mona, my good friend, Mona, my, my road dog on the East Coast to talk about what you just posted in the chat. Mona, go ahead. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, everything that Regina is talking about is just resonating with me so strongly as a communications person for a Black Theater Company, Crossroads Theater Company in Jersey, which is uh, 42 years young and is the only uh, Tony Award winning Black Theater ever. We received a Tony back in, I think, 96 or 92. In any event, one of the things we're doing, uh, we have our Town Talk series where we talk about the pertinent issues today in our community. We did one on voting. Um, we have one coming up uh, to uh, commemorate and celebrate George Floyd and all of the great things that we are so hopeful are going to come out of that. And I would uh, ask you all to go to uh, CrossroadsTheaterCompany.com to see that on the 25th. Actually, right now, and as Regina is talking about the things that she's doing, Right now, I think today is um, the third day of our Genesis series of new plays where we um, spotlight uh, the work of new playwrights uh, that are coming on uh, coming up. Right now, we're highlighting some work, and you're probably familiar, Regina, with High Arts out of New York City. We're doing some things with them, and then a, a theater company out of South Africa, uh, their new work. But um, 
with Cicely Tyson, uh, we are going to be celebrating her, her life, her artistry, her activism uh, as part of our virtual fundraising gala this year. And uh, we're working with her family and we're doing that on uh, May 20th. I would hope that Regina might be interested in being part of that program. That's what we have this happy hour. Thank you both for sharing. I also know to um, David Tyson's nephew just won uh, an award for Black Lives Matter and I, Frisco ISD. So I, he, I, are you telling me he's going to be entering this uh, uh, Black Malvern mixtape, David? Did we lose you, David? I, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Yes, yes. I, I want to make sure it's not, not my nephew, my grandson. So. <laughs> and you also are related to Cecily Tyson, aren't you? Well, you know, I, I, you know, as I said, I always claimed that for, for many, many years, even back during the days when, when, when she was married to Miles Davis, but I could never connect the, the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Uh, Tony, Tony, do we have a question for Regina? No, we, didn't get, we haven't, uh, I don't see anything posted. See, Regina, that shows how great you are, that your information and the things that we've shared in your history and your presence on, on the planet. We don't have to ask much. We just have to sit back and listen and operate after that. So thank you so much. And stay with us now while I try and go over and introduce another one of our colleagues tonight. Um, uh, thank you, Regina, so much for your presence and your imprint is immeasurable. You have um, been a game changer since the day you walked out the door and put that Polaroid on that resume. <laughs> so thank you for being here. All right. <laughs> All right, so I just want to focus on another guest we have tonight, Linda Ingo. Um, I call her one of God's special women. She's a powerhouse marketing uh, owner of Ingo Limit, and it's part of consulting, branding, and marketing, public speaking. And we have worked together with um, some of our community initiatives. She's been our celebrity taster at City Men Cook. She's part of our mentoring program. She has empowered so many young people to say that they have hope. A snapshot of her resume includes international affairs, marketing, uh, public relations, talent development, public speaking, and she's not a stranger to diversity. She and I have worked so much on diversity programs, and she was part of the, the uh, template that helped us build the diversity training that a lot of you diversity ambassadors on the call did, that we did with Politico, Facebook, uh, Google. Oh, we had a whole loss of people when we did the DNI training for NABJ. Uh, so I'm so happy to have her here. She currently is the honorary Lighthouse Ambassador recipient for the Light, of the Lighthouse Foundation, discriminating a passion for people in the community. And I asked her to come and answer a few questions. Let's, let's just put in the chat. Welcome, welcome to her. Um, she was recognized as Entrepreneur of the Year, Woman Entrepreneur of the Year by the Greater Dallas Agent Chamber, which I am a consultant to. And um, she is also part of the National Association of Professional Women is a VIP Elite Woman of the Year as well, and a lifetime member of Who's Who. Uh, she's just a phenomenal woman. I'm glad to call her, as I do Regina. I'll take claim for it. They're both part of my community wives. So no proposals, please. They're already taken for her. But anyway, so uh, I want to welcome Linda to our group. And Linda, welcome. You there? Hey. Thanks I know. Every... Every year I wonder what wife, what did I move up in rank? Am I number one this year? You never know until we hit that stage. So Regina, you're gonna find out this year once we hit this uh, July. <laughs> Might <laughs> yeah. be number one this year. <laughs> yeah, I have to put those wives in order. Uh, Linda, I have questions for you. I want you to help try to help us as communicators tell the story and control the narrative. There have been several recent attacks that have been charged with hate crimes, fueling protests and outrage among Asian Americans in this country. And and um, why uh, share with us some of the misnomers or some of the truths that we have, because a lot of these attacks have been by people of color. And I say, I'll have to speak my grandmother speak. You know, my column is all about Big Mama. And Big Mama said that all, all skin folk ain't kin folk. You know, it's not something that we as people of color would do. So can you speak to some of the misnomers about that? And I remember you sharing one thing with me, and I'll go ahead and reveal it. When we were talking about Asian hate last month, she said, this ain't new. We've been going through the same thing. You Black folks have been going through the whole time. So please share with us. 
Yeah. Um, well, hi, everybody. Happy hour. Cheers, toast to all of our Aries and everybody's birthday. Um, thank you again, Terry, for inviting me. It, it has been happening. And it, it's funny because the Asian community has always been deemed the passive culture, right? We're to shut up, keep your head down and keep working. And it's, it's funny because ideally, if you took your time to learn the, the Asian community, I d it starts at home. You know, mom and grandma tells you, oh, don't fuss about it, keep it going. And so a lot of it is self-inflicted for us as an Asian community. However, um, when it comes to these hate movements, unfortunately, I used to say that Asians weren't good enough to make the media streamline. We weren't important enough. It happens at the same time, death rates to, you know, when it comes to crime and criminal justice, you know, I used to be the only Vietnamese woman bail bond in the entire country. So I saw all sides from politics to, to the street, um, alleged criminals and everything else. And the saddest thing about the Asian community and even other foreigners is that they would sit in jail a couple days extra because there wasn't a translator. And there was no rush to, to hurry and get a translator in. So ideally, not only are we sitting in jail for a few extra days against our due process, um, because of the language barriers, they often admit to a crime just to hurry up and get home and provide for family, not knowing what they just agreed to. All they understood was get out of jail and go home type of situation. So unfortunately, there's been a whole lot of different ways that Asian communities or in communities that has a language barrier has been, you know, taken advantage of, bullied and discriminated. And we talk about this Asian hate and I, I get that there's a lot of, I didn't know there was a black against Asian thing until it hit the news and media. And I said, I thought that was kind of weird because I thought the Asian and the black community were friends and and obviously Terry you know my children are mixed with black so I've never personally seen that side in a sense now one thing that I do see and it's a fault here and there and unjust of the media at times that because there are crimes being committed against the Asian community and other communities of other colors the media does not show that so of course you know with the Atlanta shooting that was a white guy. I was um, recently in LA not too long ago. And of course I was chastised with racial slurs by some black guys. So it, it, it's it's a variety. There's no such thing as just, I, would, I hate that in our media and in our society that everything is a blanket based on individuals' experiences. If you went into a nail salon and had a bad experience, it's a whole Asian thing. If I I had a bad experience with a Caucasian issue, then it's a whole Caucasian thing. Instead of saying individual instances, it's unfair that sometimes the certain people that are pushing buttons behind the media are only depicting a certain color, obviously. So it's just an unfair representation. I think a lot of it is picking and choosing who wants to go viral, but it, I think it happens in there's a sprinkle of hate and, and, and bully and craziness in all cultures and all races and all families. You know, the biggest misconception is Asian sticks together and we're privileged, but we're, you gotta be one to know one, right? And so for us, we're the first one to cut each other off as well. I mean, family or DNA or no DNA. And so there's a lot of things that people aren't um, privy to because they just don't ask. And so the one thing I think, um, Terry, you know, the best thing about me is that I've always thanked you just for taking the time to get to know me because that is so important. And I think if everyone would just stop instead of going to their quickest judgment or reading Google or TikTok or Facebook or whatever social media platform, just get to know that one person or that individual before you make any type of judgments. And speaking to one person is not a blanket for the entire um, culture or, or family. I appreciate you sharing that, Linda. And you know, I, we, you and I work together a lot. You represent a lot of the leadership and, and in terms of their image and reputation management and their credibility, especially you and I were working on uh, documentation for some of the Asian immigrants just, just two, two nights ago. Um, 
Many Asian Americans have been left wondering how much of that is cultural stereotypes, because they always cast the women as weak or submissive. They always look like it's an oops moment. And instead of saying that this is an egregious attack against Americans who happen to be Asian, they always want to pull uh, the women in as a weak person. What are some of the ways that we can control these narratives and who would we be talking to to make sure that we tell a true story of what's going on with not just the black community, but the Asian community as well? I think what you'll find is the Asian communities have nervousness when it comes to the immigration, whether they're, they're, they just don't want to start any trouble because any types of trouble, they'll get deported. And that's the last thing they want. So you will find a lot of them that will just take the beatings and keep it moving and it's the saddest part and I don't know if I fell too hard when I was a kid and I didn't catch that gene but I'm extremely <laughs> vocal and you'll just have to unfortunately find that person or the the group of people that will speak because again unfortunately there are some things that even sometimes when I do speak and I am um, focusing on trying to be the Asian voice of course for the Dallas County, it is tough sometimes because a lot of the Asian communities don't want you to cause trouble or they don't want that attention, even though it's needed and every, even though it's good, it's kind of a hit and miss and it's just kind of a catch 22 because they don't want that attention, but at the same time they're dying. Um, the Asian community and you know, Terry, working with the immigration here, the Vietnamese especially are the first probably one of the highest suicidal rates. So with the Asian culture, we would rather commit suicide than to be someone's burden, right. even if it's family. And right. I, I'm pretty sure working with GDAC, we've seen a lot of that, um, trying to help them here and there, but it's tough. It's, it's really, really, really tough to find Asians that are okay with that attention. Because even though I'm in this situation and, hat and, and photo shoots and stuff, I'm, I run. And you've known that every single time we have to take a photo, I'm like, do I really have to? And even submitting a photo, I'm like, Terry, can you just pick one? Because the all eyes on me is a little scary at times. But when it comes, for me, it has to be with a cause and a purpose. You'll get me if there's a cause and a purpose. But other than that, it is tough. It is it is tough because there's so many Asian families who maybe two out of the entire family is legally here. And they don't want to upset the rest of the family. Or there's some type of fear there and they don't want to be retaliated or for us in our culture, we're starting trouble. So if we just stop giving in to all the bullying, we just focus on providing, then they'll eventually leave us alone is, is kind of their mindset until you run into somebody like me or a few other local Asians. Hey, thank you so much. It's almost as if the public just discovered that there's anti-Asian bias, discrimination and hatred in the country. And what's upsetting is that it took so much violence for people to take this discrimination seriously, not just among us, but among Asians as well. Manny, you have a question for Linda? Can you unmute and ask your question? I see him. I, I don't have the stats, Manny. Okay. Sorry, um, the other part of my question was that how much of this hatred directed at the Asian community do you blame on the rhetoric of the former President Trump? Sorry, y'all. I just got a new puppy, so she's wanting to speak on my behalf. <laughs> you know, obviously, it, proof is in the pudding, right? We've been bullied. We've been hated on. We've been unfairly done for so long, but it wasn't until COVID in our last administration when he kept calling it the Kung Fu virus or China virus or whatnot, that it's been um, the focal point of the media. So at this point, you've gotten Jeremy Lin, who plays professional basketball, who gets called the coronavirus on the court. Get off virus, you're the virus. And he's literally in the middle of a game and being called the coronavirus. We have Hispanic guys who literally stopped in the middle of a protest, an Asian organized peaceful protest, and he got out of his car to yell and scream because COVID kill his, killed his mother. So we were the blame and he wanted to stop the protest. So there's a little bit of the media attention is, is definitely 100% heightened because of that rhetoric. Thank you, Linda. Clifton. Sure. 
So this is interesting because I'm still focused on what's important to me. I was ignorant of this. I didn't know that. And, and so my question is for those people who may not be aware of this, um, of this issue, what do you think people can do to create more of a, um, can we just get along? You know what I mean? I think it's the power of patience. It's the power of choosing to go get to know one of your Asian brothers and sister and family and entity. And, and next time you go to an establishment that could be Asian run, just start having a friendly conversation. The biggest thing I want to give out is P PSA wise is that a lot of the times the Asians come off harsh. It's not because they don't like you. It's just the language and the dialect and they're having a hard time pronouncing um, properly. And so sometimes it could be misconstrued as very mean. And because I have an aunt that way and she could be loving you. And but by the looks of her face, you're in trouble. And so there's a lot of that miscommunication. And so a lot of the times, if you would just sit down and talk to somebody and a few of those somebodies, then you do get a chance to actually learn their cultures, learn everything that they've gone through. I've been a, a victim of rape, abuse. I, my dad shot and killed my mother when I was three. We've been homeless before because of domestic violence. Those have no racial barriers. Those have no, we're not excluded because we're Vietnamese or we're black or we're white or we're Hispanic. We're all human, we're a human race. And until we can actually truly invest in each other and give each other genuine time with an open mind and learn how to articulate without feeling disrespected and taking off our sensitivity, sensitivity hat, knowing that there, when you strip the fluff and the emotions, there is no malice intent. So with no malice intent, it's genuinely an opportunity to learn about one another. I mean, I'm still learning more about my culture. And when I won the award for 2014, 2015 GDAC Woman of the Year, I felt that I didn't know enough. I felt that I didn't do enough for our Asian community. So once I won that award, I worked backwards. I'm like, okay, well, shoot, let me go earn what you just gave me versus just rewarding me for something that you you're saying I did, but I felt like I didn't do enough. So I went and learned about the Mead Center. I went and learned about how many immigrants here. There was over 10,000 um, immigrants, Asian immigrants here in the Dallas uh, County community area. And so there was just so many different things that I wanted to do to create jobs and create voices and be their voices. And I, I think, you know, if you're, you have a platform, get to know your Asian brothers and sisters, your Hispanic brothers and sisters, and have a voice and share that voice, share that experience on social media, the way all this negative crap is shared. And then that way, hopefully positivity and unity can actually be a, the next viral thing. Oh, Linda, thanks for doing that. I did place in the chat a statement that you shared with me last week uh, from uh, Dr. Sherry Wang. And it says that um, another stereotype that contributes to ongoing anti-Asian bias and hate in this is the model minority myth. There's the myth that Asian Americans are unilaterally successful, well adapted because they are quiet and submissive and hardworking. In fact, the stereotype was manufactured during the civil rights movement to weaponize Asian Americans against black Americans and it masked the diversity of the whole Asian experience and what they've gone through. Uh, I think David uh, Tyson that more so when they tried to show that division of uh, between uh, Koreans and a, um, um, a blacks during the, the early parts of the 60s. And, and, and I appreciate you for sharing the fact that Asians are different people as well. Um, you know, I worked with as a um, community communications consultant to Fuji at the time. I worked with them because they had an internal communications problem and they thought that they, they, they set generic rules for internal communications that didn't work and they didn't realize that they were dealing with people from Cambodia, Thailand, mm -hmm. and, and the biggest conflict were the people who were from mainland China and the people who were from China, uh, ta Taiwan, and then the Japanese. And they didn't realize that they had their own differences and they had their own right. conflicts. And so therefore their internal communication system was failing. And I was able to, to write, a, uh, write a new communication system and do some training to get them to understand so I do thank you for sharing that. Uh, it sometimes feel like an all-out all-out assault on racism 
that Manny Otico kind of highlighted who, what, what started all this. It, it didn't start, it just highlighted and moved it to a level of prominence. So we all have to engage in self-care at, at the policy level, cultural sensitivity level, and to control our narratives. And I thank you for being on the call and, and thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I think I learned even more about the Asian and, and the different communities watching old martial arts films. So if you guys love reading subtitles, definitely watch the Ip Man's IP Man, which is the, I guess he's deemed as um, Bruce Lee's original uh, Sifu, but between watching Ip Man, I think three, I think part three and part four, and then of course the Bruce Lee's, it showed how Asian and Blacks united. It showed that the Korean, I mean, the Japanese and China were bumping heads. So that's Asian on Asian. So it's literally, I, I hate that it's, it's always deemed one or the other. It's, it seems like at times we're competing to have the biggest negative headlines you know, as cultures and race, and that's unfortunate. And again, it goes back to having personal experiences with opposite races or colors or cultures or whatnot. And then that one person having a platform enough to be vocal, and then that gets deemed as a racial cultural thing versus an independent individual situation. Well, I, I appreciate that so much. And uh, I'm gonna close with the introduction of our last guest, and she's got a question that she placed in the chat I'd like for her to ask, but let me introduce, thank you by the way, Linda, and thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for making me look good. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> thanks for wearing I'm working on that wife's ranking this year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for wearing your Regina has way too big shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, but let me go ahead and announce and uh, bring on uh, to the table, Chelsea Phillips. She's the new media She's the media related representative, board representative for NABJ. Uh, she is uh, currently serves as the deputy and director and media strategist for Blackbird Communication. She supervises the accounts for such clients as the, the Movement for Black Lives, the Me Too Movement, and has also worked with Black Lives Matter, the Dream Defenders Organization, and, and the Workers Center for Racial Justice. And before that, she was at another prog program that I work with a lot, the Advancement Project. Um, and as an experienced journalist, she's a regular contributor to a lot of things. She has a passion for communications and media strategy. And so let's welcome Chelsea Fuller. Chelsea, are you there? Can you ask uh, Linda your question? Yeah, hey, thanks, Terry. And thanks How are you, Chelsea? I'm doing all right. Nice to see everyone. Linda, thank you so much for joining. Regina, also, um, thanks so much for, for joining. This is my first happy hour, um, so I feel like I joined a fantastic conversation as my, my first official uh, welcome to the space, because um, I'm not usually able to join these meetings. Um, so really glad and grateful for the conversation. Um, Linda, I'll probably hit you up offline, um, because okay. I need you coming um, to time, but I just really wanted to talk more just about storytelling and narrative opportunities that you see um, that perhaps NABJ and other organizations represented on this call could be thinking about in terms of closing that divide um, in terms of how we're thinking about systemic racism across communities of color. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to, to see everyone um, and appreciate um, the quick opportunity I have um, to talk to you all. Um, some of you have reached out to me personally since um, I was appointed to the board. I really appreciate that. I've really in appreciated the conversations that we've been able to have, but really have been anxious to have um, a more robust conversation with all of you as a group and with all of the members of the task force. I think um, Terry and the leadership of the task force have done a tremendous job over the past few years of cultivating a space of practitioners and, and strategists and people that are thinking really critically about um, how communications people contribute to the creation of good journalism, right? How we are all in different ways contributing to um, narrative shift and how we're helping people across community build narrative power, specifically narrative power for black people, um, which I think is really important. Um, and you, I'll let you all be the first folks to know um, that I do currently work at Blackbird, um, which is one of the firms um, that was really in a role in the narrative shifts that we saw happening um, from 2014 around the death of Michael Brown and Ferguson um, throughout the racial reckoning that's almost a, a decade in the making now, but generations in the making if we really are being realistic. And it's been a true honor to work with that team. Um, but I will be taking a new job um, starting the beginning of May as the Vice President of Communications for Time's Up. 
um, which is a global movement, um, an organization working in service to survivors of sexual violence um, that was birthed out of the viral Me Too moment that happened in 2017. So y'all are kind of some of the first folks to know that I will be taking that job. It has not been publicly announced yet, um, but you will see the press about that very soon. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that with y'all. Um, I have a call with our president here after this call. She doesn't even know yet, so y'all know before Dorothy. Um, but saying all that to say, um, I am really committed to making sure that all of the spaces that I'm in, um, that we are thinking really critically about leadership, particularly in this moment. And as communicators, um, I wanna engage with you all and, and hear more from you all just about the ways that you're thinking about the leadership of communications professionals um, in this moment, but also um, in the years to come, because we'll never think about issues of systemic violence the same way again. We'll never think about race the same way again. I hope people are thinking differently and will continue to grow and evolve in their understanding of these issues. Um, and a lot of times folks look at communicators and you know, folks working across the kind of PR and ad space um, as separate and apart from um, the folks that are actually working on the front lines of change. And that's just really not true. Um, and in terms of NABJ in this space um, in particular, um, I've, been, I've been told and I've been asked and welcomed into some conversations about how to expand the way that our membership think about this particular task force, right? How to make it so that folks understand, like it's not just people that do corporate public, you know, public relations work. It's not just for folks that are doing advertising work and all of that is important, but that it's a space for folks who are doing communications work across the spectrum from nonprofit and NGO organizations to folks at, you know, the highest levels of corporate America. Um, because all of us have to have, you know, these really critical conversations like Terry was saying about, um, the stories that have to be told, the ways that we have to engage with clients and partners um, to help move multiple needles. Um, but I'm really interested in, in figuring out how to best support you all in the work that you're doing inside of NABJ um, so that we are thinking about membership differently, that we're bringing in folks that have different experiences um, from different walks of life who think about communications differently. Um, we have, I think I put this on the agenda, um, we have two requests from large communications institutions that really want to work with NABJ in some new ways. Um, organizations that um, have members who are individually associated with NABJ, but who don't have um, direct connections to this task force, some of them who didn't even know it existed, right? One of those organizations is the Radical Communicators Network. I've shared this with Terry. It's been in our board reports a couple of times. They really want to figure out how to work with this group specifically. It's a group of thousands of um, progressive communicators working across politics, you know, NGO spaces, corporate America, um, who are really thinking about communications um, and public relations work in some really innovative and creative ways that are connected to ending particular kinds of violence against impacted communities, right? So what, the conversation we just had here tonight is an example of that kind of work. So I'm gonna drop the link to Radcoms in the chat. So oh, I think I sent it to somebody directly. Sorry. Share it with everyone. So that's one request that has come in um, and want us to think about that and talk about the possibilities there as a group. Um, and then the Black Public Relations Society, which I know we have really great relationships with already. Um, they've seen a need in this moment of COVID and particularly the past couple of months to have more conversations about the ways in which communications professionals are actually preparing their clients to deal um, with issues of systemic violence and racism internally, um, not just you know, preparing them to message externally, right? Which was a big part of what a lot of us do, helping people figure out how to interject um, a positive message into a current narrative playing out in the mainstream. I think that's a tremendous opportunity. Um, so I wanted to bring those two to Terry and to all of you. Um, and I'm trying to speak really quickly so I don't go over time. I want folks to have a chance to ask questions if there are some. But yeah, I'm, I'm really focused on helping NABJ collectively um, have some of the hard conversations that we've needed to have, right? Not just specific to this task force, um, but there's been you know, several instances um, where NABJ has been asked to step up to make you know, demands in, in these moments that we've seen around the racialized violence happening in communities, but also there's been calls to action that have come internally from different task force and from different members. Um, and NABJ is up to the challenge, um, but knows that there's work that has to be done to prepare and to make sure that we're standing in our values and that we're actually addressing harm where harm is happening um, without it being disingenuous um, and making sure that the work that we're doing puts us in a position to 
create sustainable change, not just tactical momentary, you know, momentary change. Um, so I'm, I'm holding a lot of that for the organization, but I also want all of you to know that I am available to you. Um, there's several new um, board members and many of us are first time board members. So we've decided that we're gonna hold um, regular office hours, monthly office hours. It's not always um, you know, easy to get folks on a call, you know, and I appreciate everyone's um, effort to try and make sure that there's opportunities for me to be able to check in um, with you all. Um, mm -hmm. So to make that a little bit easier on the leadership and myself, we're gonna have regular office hours that will be publicized so folks can come and talk to me and other board members directly about some of the questions that they have, work that they wanna do, um, or to just engage, to be in the know about um, some of the stuff that's happening that we don't often have, well, I haven't had an opportunity as of yet to really get into with all of you. Um, so those were my agenda items. I will hush and again, just really grateful for the chance to talk to you all and look forward to being able to engage with you um, in the coming months and years, hopefully. I'm not going anywhere, so. <laughs> Thank you for the scoop, Chelsea. Congratulations on the move. You, it's well-deserved. Uh, your, your imprint has always been great. Uh, I got a chance to scrape across you when you were leaving the advancement project, and I, I think your, your imprint and your movement is great. We're so happy to have you on the call, and, and I'll say this out front in front of everybody so we get it right. We will be more than happy to have another call on your timeline. So just let us know when and how, and we will, we will have a direct call with the membership and the task force with you. And so thank you so much, and congratulations. You got a BP title. All right, now, that's a C-suite move. We appreciate you. All right, so does anybody have any questions for Chelsea? I think there was one. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Chelsea. Uh, congratulations on your job, your new job. And thanks for all the like tea you just spilled today. Um, my question is around um, training and uh, job relate, media related job fairs. Cause I know we're a part of a journalism association, which is great. Um, but oftentimes when I look for like jobs and um, even like training that's more media related, I'm not seeing that. So I was just wondering, is that something NABJ is going to do or should I continue to look more on the PRSA side um, for that type of training? Yeah, thank you so much, Jade. And thank you to everyone who um, chatted me in the public chat and, and, and personally with the congratulations. I appreciate it. So training is a huge is a huge thing. It was something that I talked a lot about um, with Dorothy before deciding to accept this appointment um, because it had there has been a lack of uh, both resources and just space and capacity given to media related members in the way of training um, and other developmental opportunities that sometimes our colleagues on the journalism side do get. So there are some conversations about it. One of the things that felt really exciting about um, the National Black Public Relations Society um, wanting to work more closely with the task force is it is a training opportunity. They want to develop a set of trainings with the task force specifically for media related members um, that deal with some of the more traditional you know, facets of, of the work, but also that focus on preparing our members to do comms and media related work um, in some new spaces and areas, right? There's, when we do see these trainings, a lot of time they are focused on folks that do more traditional kinds of communications work, which is limiting, right? Our membership is more than 50%, I think at this point, um, our folks under the age of 35, of those members that are communications, you know, that work in the communications industry, a lot of them have really creative and innovative and just different job titles and are holding different roles, um, all of which contribute to this task force, all of which contribute to the work of communications professionals, um, and all that contribute to the creation of good journalism, right, especially that of Black journalists. So there, it, the, the leadership are seeing a need in a space, um, a need for a space um, for more training. So that's something I'm pushing for. But that organization that I shared the link of, Rad uh, the Radical Communicators uh, Network, provides tremendous training to communications professionals, many of whom are of color. Um, and I'm gonna put another group in here as well. Um, Reframe is a training um, organization for communicators, specifically for communicators um, who are looking to help their organizations kind of message the moment, right? Social impact, social change, communications work is their specialty, but they provide um, various levels of communications training from like executive level coaching, which is something I, I do for them um, to kind of the one on one stuff. So give them a give them a look, but you will see more training opportunities coming in the year. All right. Anyone else? Hey, Chelsea. Uh, nice, nice to see you. Congratulations on uh, on your uh, on your ascension to the C-suite. That's uh, really important. That's a great move for you. 
Thank you. Uh, saying you congratulations. Um, first question I have for you is, um, is there any chance that there'll be more award categories uh, and recognitions for the media related group? Because when you go to the, um, the Salute to Excellence dinner, which is really one of, the, one of my favorite events at the convention, there are scores of events for folks in print and television, but there's only one award or two awards for the media related folks. And if you're a media related person there, you kind of feel a little, probably a little more than slighted. Uh, is there any chance that uh, we can expand the award categories and recognize more folks? Thank you, Tony. And that's a, that's a really great, great question. That's something that I've been advocating for. Um, that, that was a big thing for me um, in my last post as the chair of the Young Journalist Task Force was just the expansion of categories in general, right? Not just specific to us as comms people, but across the board. So it is something that's on our, our plate to discuss um, internally as a board, the, just the, you know, doing a revisiting of the categories where this um, task force's leadership is concerned, I think from Terry um, to Misty, you know, across the board, leaders of this space have contributed so much to the work of the organization and it really just feels unfair and just nonsensical to not have more than one category. Mm -hmm. And I think based on what I'm hearing in the conversations that I'm a part of, um, it feels like there's been, for some reason, um, some you know, misconception that the work of communications folks or media related folks in this organization is really only um, in the corporate space, right? So if they're gonna honor somebody, it, it needs to be some you know, PR executive who's had 50, 60 years of experience at the highest echelons of the, of the industry. And that's just not fair because we're honoring people across you know, the organization who hold different titles who are, you know, we have the emerging award that's honoring someone who's at the beginning of their career, right? So we should have that same level of diversity of acknowledgement for media related members as well. So it's a conversation that's happening. I would advise Terry and, and the leadership of this task force to put forward a proposal. I'm sure that's already happened, um, but now with you know the conversation that we're having now, it feels like the right time to, to nudge um, and you would have my full support and I would carry that over the finish line um, if it was the last thing that I do. Cause I've had real issue just being transparent with you, um, with all of you um, with the way that the awards are handled in the past. Um, in terms of the diversity of um, folks who get these awards and gender diversity, gender identity, right? We have not had um, enough diversity um, across the board, um, age diversity, all of those things. So folks are listening. Um, so I would advise that, you know, let's get into it. Let's, you know, let's use this as a moment to push, you know, push for what we want and let me know how I can be supportive. If you wanna submit something for our next board meeting, I would love that, I would love that. Speaking of pushing for what we what we want, what about um, the possibility of? Uh, I, I know there was just a uh, just a question asked about training, having more uh, more uh, uh, trainings and but particularly more uh, sessions during the convention because it always seems as though there's only a few media related sessions, and when you when you, you know you like especially during the uh, the sessions now that are virtual you really have to kind of pick and choose where you know and it and it and it always seems as though there are only a few uh, actual offerings is there a way we can perhaps expand the offerings and and maybe have just a, like a media related track during the convention which is just for the media related folks and then we can all submit ideas and we can have more more course offerings during the conventions uh, and and uh, Chelsea, before you respond to that, let me give you some background. We have tried to put together, and we're, we're going to need your support. We're putting together a media institute that's going to deal with the track for us. And I do want to go on record for saying our last in-person conference and our last virtual conference did have a full roster of media-related um, workshops. And they were standing room only, and they were full. So we just want to, we need your support, and we also need to be engaged with you to make sure we continue that. Uh, we're not lacking programming. We just want to make sure we have more of a visible imprint because we've done a fantastic job in the next two years. And we definitely we definitely know that you are one of the best warriors for this and that we need to go back. And I have um, approached, uh, I'm part of Beepers too, and I've approached some of the PR firms and they're willing to put some dollars behind it so that we could have not just a track at convention, but to have a media institute on there and I'm, we're running out of time, but I just want to make sure we said that and, and um, 
Uh, I think we have a question from Ron and then from Pam. But you can go ahead and respond, Chelsea. Uh, hi, Chelsea. Uh, welcome and congratulations on all of the great news you just uh, uh, made us aware of. Uh, my question is, I'm following up a little bit on what Tony asked, and it's related to awards. Um, over the last couple of years, I would say over the last two or three years, we have had individuals who have obtained, I think the only award that this group is able to receive on behalf of NABJ, the Pat Tobin Awards. And what has happened is that there are individuals who have received the award that, and I'm not the award keeper, but there are a lot of individuals who have received this award and really don't deserve to have it. Normally the person is a friend of someone who sits on the board and that person is pushed forward. And they really, as one of our colleagues would say, have no skin in the game. They don't represent anything that Pat Tobin represent besides just being a PR person. So I'm wondering if there is a way uh, that, and it, I, I, I love your energy and I love the fact that you're gonna be proactive, but I'm wondering if there's a way that we can stop that from happening in the future. I know we're a part of a journalism organization and a lot of times PR people are pushed to the back of the bus. But the thing is, when I look at the dues that I pay, both locally and nationally, and the dues that the journalists pay, there's no big difference. So I feel as if sometimes we're slighted, and uh, I hope that you know I'm willing to be of whatever assistance I can be in helping you chart a better course for us. But right now we're treated as kind of stepchildren and. Pat Tobin Award. I knew, I know Pat personally. She was a dear friend of mine, and I know who she is. And some of the people that has received the award in her name really doesn't deserve it. Thank you for that, Ron. Um, and I, I agree with much of what you've said. And it's been, you know, an internal and a very public conversation about NABJ in terms of how award recipients are selected. Right? There is this, you know, perception. Um, that's rooted in some truth. And I know I'm a new kid, um, but I've been a member of NABJ since I was 18. So, and in leadership, my entire um, professional career. So I've, I've seen how the sausage is made, but I've also been, you know, someone calling crap out on, on the outside, right? That NABJ sometimes does run like um, a fraternity or a sorority, right? It's like who is in a particular, the folks in a particular clique that have a particular access to power often make decisions that are representative of the whole organization. And that's just actually not the way that a democratic um, and value-based organization should run. Part of the reason why I think we're having issues with that particular award, and I have called that out in years past, is because the people that are making the decision largely don't know anything about communications. Outside of, you know, Terry being on the board, for all those years, nobody else on the board has any experience with communications in a really intentional way, but also that has a level of expertise to be able to assess someone's viability or someone's work acumen, someone's contributions to the field, right? There are people that would say that they knew, but they actually don't. So one of my recommendations is expanding the ways that we're making the final decision about all of the award nominees, right? And the folks that are getting the awards, because I know I've worked as a journalist I should not have the same weight. My decision should not bear the same weight as a communications professional or someone who has only worked on the editorial side. Like if we're thinking about the, you know, someone winning for visual journalism or broadcast journalism as somebody who's been in that field for 10, 15, 20 years, right? So there's not, an, there's not enough equity and there's not enough diversity of experience um, in how we're making these decisions. So I'm addressing it on the as a board member from that regard to help open up the opportunity to see more diverse and more um, you know, to see an increase of worthy, I'll say, uh, candidates for the, for the nomination and for the award itself, but it has to be that external and internal pressure. So I'm happy to support y'all from the task force level as any way that I can, because I Thank agree you. that some of the folks that have received it, I, I was a little bit confused as to why. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amazing answer, Chelsea. Thank you so much. I think this has been great. And Chelsea, I do want to work and find a way for us to have another conversation with our board rep on your time and get the other 22 members that registered for this event that signed up and get them on the board. Because not only do we want you to be the warrior, we want you to have some, some soldiers. 
you know, and we can get these soldiers uh, coming at you. And so thank you for that. And thank you for the recognition um, that under the, when I was on the board, we got Ron, Ronald Run became our Pat Tobin Award winner. We got nominations from Tanisha. We got people who are actually in the work. And, and one of Pam's favorite word is that they had some skin in the game. And so we did do that. And I'm glad that you recognize that. And I want to make sure we get those office hours and I'll put them out as soon as I can. You have done an amazing job talking to us today. I'm so glad you moved whatever you do. And I know you got a lot of stuff you're doing on Sunday. I'm so glad you moved it to be here. And I hope you like your picture on the flyer because it's the only one I can find. <laughs> so thank you for this. And let's get engaged and do more. Um, thank you so much. And in closing, I want to thank all of you. Re Regina, thank you for making us see our Blackness authentically and intentionally. Linda, thank you for letting us know that all kin folk, all skin folk and kin folk. And we have to understand that there is some similarities. And Chelsea, thank you for coming board. And all the uh, board members, thank you for en engaging those conversations with Chelsea here and with her in, uh, personally and directly. Thanks everyone, this has been great. I just wanna close with saying one thing. We have to focus on self-care. That was one of the first things we did here with our group. And, and we have to focus on self-care because we have this discrimination and hate that has been fueled has caused a lot of psychological and, and physical distress. Uh, just watching the, the Floyd, George Floyd trial, I had to stop in order to continue my, to work. So it, it's, it's, we've got to support each other and focus on controlling these narratives. I, uh, I'm gonna say, make sure that you are watching and participate in the black tape, uh, the black mixtape, you gotta go and do this. And uh, I will distribute the one that we did at SMU that Regina did. Thank you for that imprint, Regina. Uh, we have got to control the narrative. And I put in the chat earlier, my article I did on my column that we must, in order to make this moment of movement, we have to maintain momentum. Let's do that. Let's go out and keep doing what we're doing. And let's make sure we support our board rep. Let's give her all the tools she needs to make sure we are represented. Let's change this narrative internally within our organization and let's increase the success of the narrative and the imprint that Regina Taylor has made across this country and her whole, and every character she's chose to portray and every production she's chose to produce and every documentary she's done. It has always been un, uh, unapologetically black. It has been culturally competent. So the, our next Zoom is gonna be coming for, we're gonna have the USBI Virgin Islands, and we're going to be talking about the impact to the communicators in the Caribbean. And we're also going to be talking about that, that, that elephant in the room, black men in PR. So looking forward to you guys talking. And you can go ahead and save the chat. We're going to close our call. I'd like to go ahead and put my speaker screen up. And I want to go ahead and capture all of us waving and saying goodbye today. And thank you. And make sure the emails are flying. And please be transparent with your emails. No backdoor conversations. Let's make sure we're all engaged because each one of us has an answer. So let's start waving now. While I will go ahead and make us. Oh, those hands are beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, you guys know how to reach me. I'm going to close the call. And so you guys can say, take off your mutes and say some goodbyes and everything else because I'm going to be setting the call off in two minutes. So let's start talking. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Miss Regina. It's an honor. Thank you. Bye, right. Hey, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I really had a question for her, but... Thanks to all the speakers. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Regina. Thank you. 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 Linda, I we'll need, be in touch. I need your support. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Harass Terry if you need any of my info. Just stalk him if you <laughs> haven't already gotten it. <laughs> He's good at stalking. So, yeah, let her do that. <laughs> if you haven't gotten it already, just that, stalk him that's for anything. That's why we have drinks at the happy hour because of Linda. <laughs> <laughs> just some yeah. enhancing. Oh, to that. I just Terry, don't forget my, my t shirt. shirt. I won't forget. Yeah. We're going to get your pastor to give yeah, you a T-shirt. I'm not dealing with my past. I have nothing uh, to do uh, Pam, with that. Pam, Pam, did you not get a, a gracious gift box just like two days ago? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> he wore her T-shirt. <laughs>
She got, she so got, we, Pam got we go to that site and, and fill and, out the information. Ma'am, I'm going to take it out loud. Pam got some, my best guest. She got some Kamala Harris pearls. She got some what? Phi, what? Phi Beta, pearls? Beta Phi Beta Blue. No, he, I didn't get no pearls. Yeah, you did. <laughs> To say he needs to send everybody a whole new package right now. You need to make us all even. Oh, wait, come on, Lindy. Yeah, I'll take a new care package. Uh -huh. You guys take care. Goodbye now. Bye. 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 Bye.